Thanks, Anita, and thanks to Teamworks and Influencer for bringing us together for this uh, great opportunity. And a, and a very special thank you to our panel members. Uh, I deeply appreciate the courage it takes to have an open conversation about mental health and well being and speaking from a personal perspective. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. And just to kind of set the table, the hope today is that we really let this become a glimpse behind the curtain a little bit to hear from the consumers our graduated student athletes from the college student athlete experience from a diversity of perspective, experience and stories, um, and also to offer feedback so that our athletics departments and universities that serve collegiate student athletes can have a better understanding of, of what this issue means to the student athlete. So the hope that today is gonna further enhance our awareness and recognition of mental illness and mental health as priority concerns as well as the importance of resources and developing cultures that really promote healthy and, and uh, well student athletes. Another important mission today is going to be to further address stigma and reduce stigma around mental health and reduce the disparity in how physical and mental health issues and physical and mental illness issues are managed and treated and cared for. Briefly about my professional journey, I've been at the University of Virginia for over 20 years now in a few different capacities, formerly as a neuropsychologist and now as the sports psychologist uh, for the athletics department. And, um, I work as a uh, licensed clinical psychologist serving the well-being of, of our student athletes. Throughout my career, I prioritized understanding and caring for what I would consider to be the invisible injuries and illnesses that affect people. Mild traumatic brain injury, sports concussion, and mental illness. And what strikes me and many of those of us who provide this care is that there really is no one size fits all for any of these conditions. And there's also no uniform presentation for how they show up or how it's experienced. And therefore the, the critical importance of having an individualized care plan for everyone. It's also striking to me that invisibility is its own substantial form of stigma when it comes to recognizing, validating the need seeking care and even providing the care when it comes to mental health and mental illness. And this stigma, this invisibility stigma is on top of so many others that face our student athletes today and create barriers to accessing and using care. So hopefully this dialogue and conversation further reduces stigma and also offers universities and athletic departments a clearer perspective on what they're doing well and what they can do better to make the invisible more visible more heard and foster cultures that really do prioritize the well-being and mental health of our student athletes. Thanks for bearing with me for that introduction and uh, now on to much more interesting and, and exciting speakers. So um, I'll throw it over to, uh, to our panel and see who wants to start and introduce themselves and where they're from. I can start. Um, my name is Jocelyn. Well, first, Jason, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Willoughby. I am from New Jersey. I'm a graduate of the University of Virginia. Um, so Jason is a familiar face, a uh, fellow Wahoo, as we call ourselves. Um, I am currently a professional women's basketball player. I just finished my rookie season with the New York Liberty in the WNBA and am um, preparing to go overseas um, should things with COVID and everything else in the world kind of clear up a little bit within the coming weeks. So thank you for having me and I'm excited for this conversation. I guess I'll go next. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel. Um, thanks Jason and Jocelyn and Jake for all doing this with me. I greatly appreciate it. I think this is a great topic for us to be talking about, especially um, all of us being previous um, student athletes and just having knowledge in that background. But um, I'm originally from Michigan, um, but I grew up in North Carolina. I attended the University of Eastern Michigan for my first two years of college, competed gymnastics and then transferred to the University of Florida, um, graduated there in 2018, and then um, got my master's at Florida while I was a manager working for the gymnastics team. And now I'm currently living in Arizona and work for um, Sun Devil Gymnastics. So lots of gymnastics, but I love it and I'm excited to chat with everyone today. Go ahead, Jake. <laughs> 
Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Jake Lawler. I am a UNC graduate. I graduated uh, a year early from school um, this past May. Um, I was a linebacker during my time at Chapel Hill. Uh, I was thankful for my experience, but I was kind of looking down either continuing to play and not making the NFL because I knew I wasn't good enough to make it or um, graduate a year early and pursue my dreams working in the entertainment space. So I moved out to Hollywood in July um, and I'm now a creative assistant at a production company as well as working on some of my other projects that we've written and shot and created and I'm excited to be here with our, my fellow panelists and I appreciate everyone for coming out to listen. So. Thank you all. It's uh, it really is amazing to me to hear, and I've heard your stories a little bit once before, but hearing them again, it's it's amazing to consider the different walks and paths that you not only took to get to being a collegiate student athlete, but what you've been doing differently since. So, um, thanks for being willing to to share your uh, background, and now a little bit um, about what made this topic important to you and spoke to you, and and what uh, made being courageous and strong at joining this panel, something that you really felt you wanted to do. And, and, and maybe I'll go in reverse order and, and uh, uh, pitch it to you, Jake, to talk first a little bit about your experience uh, that led you to, to be on this panel today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so initially I always describe my experience with football as serendipitous. It's something that I never really would have considered a possible or even a probable or anything of that nature growing up i was raised in a family of artists and intellectuals as i like to call it um I, the story that i always regale people with is that when i got my first offer um heading into my junior year uh, i got it from duke and the coach told me that i had a scholarship offer to play and i wasn't aware what exactly he was talking about because in my mind how football worked is that or how college football worked is that students would try out in August and the best players would make the team. I had no inclination that there was any sort of recruitment process. So he told me that I had a scholarship offer and my grandparents didn't know anything about it either. And then we had to look up what scholarship offer meant on Wikipedia on the ride home. And then like 15 minutes into uh, uh, the drive, I was like, oh, they want me to play football here. So I, I thought that was cool. Um, but all of that to say that this is something that I was thankful for the experience, but at the same time, the reason that I'm on this panel today is because ultimately through all of that, I had been dealing with depression for the past eight years of my life. The past six of those were with uh, depression mixed with suicidal thoughts. I've had two failed suicide attempts. The first was in high school. The most recent was in January of 2019. Um, and then after that, after that failed attempt, the only person that had known throughout those eight years was my roommate for the last three. And he told me that I needed to start telling people because he didn't want to be responsible for my death, which I thought was a valid concern. Um, and I heeded his words and I did a lot of internal soul searching. And then basically through late May um, to early June of that year of 2019, I, it, took, it was a three week process. I wrote a 2300 word essay documenting my entire experiences with depression, um, trying to understand why I was feeling the way I was feeling, um, where all this was coming from, and the first time really reckoning with um, instead of running from what I was encountering. And I published that piece to have it go viral um, because I knew being a black male college athlete, I would hit the toxic masculinity triangle. and if I could be someone that is, has a platform and is doing all these different things in all these different spaces, and then was vulnerable and courageous enough to be able to facilitate a better discussion surrounding mental health um, for the black community, for the male community, and also for the collegiate athletic community, it's something that I wanted to do. So I did that. And then ever since then, I've been really active in time in terms of speaking out on, on these issues and, uh, I've been much better since that. I've, I've gotten help. I've done my own sort of uh, soul searching and ultimately I found out what I wanted to do and that's why I'm out in LA and that's exactly why I'm here. So, so thank you for sharing that, Jake, and, and uh, quite, a, quite a journey for you um, with some episodes, it sounds like, of pretty dark spaces. And, and a lot of times suicide is conceptualized as a 
a perceived solution to a perceived and solvable problem. Um, and that may be true for some, but not all. And just thinking about your experience, was there something that you could identify as you were doing the cathartic kind of review um, in, in preparing your manuscript? Was there something that you could point to and say, this is part of what the perception, the perceived unsolvable problem was, or was it something that has even to this day remained somewhat hard to fathom for you? Yeah, it, for a long time, I think it was shrouded in mystery uh, until I did that three week process. Th that was probably the darkest three weeks of my life because it was the first time in my life where I was revisiting the trauma that um, plagued my past instead of just pushing it down and treating it as a sedation and not a solution. Um, ultimately, what I learned through that operative experience is that the common through line that I hear with people that I counsel or people that I talk with that have felt the same things and that have dealt with depression and suicidal thoughts and tendencies is that that the belief that no one will care about you if you're gone, the belief that um, you are your life is invalid and that no one would care if you opened up and told anyone and that that crippling pressure to keep it hidden is something that resonated with me with but at the same time my depression was operated a little bit different because i was a role model in my community because i had done all these different things in these different spaces and south charlotte which is where i'm from is a community of its own right and because i was one a prominent figure in the burgeoning young community of south charlotte my depression was so that because I was a role model for all these people, I had to continue doing that. I had to be like at every meeting, every parent teacher conference, practice, everything like that. And if I missed a deadline, if I let someone down, if I put some, if I put my needs before someone else's, uh, then my life was forfeit. And then by being forfeit, I no longer deserve to live on this planet. And at least that's, that's how I thought because it was suicide was never something that was romanticized in my head. It would, how I operated, it was a survival mechanism. I did everything in my power because I, I never wanted to die. It was just something that I felt like I, I needed to do if I failed somebody else. Um, so that's really what I learned throughout that process. Um, and now I know like ultimately that's not true. So um, you spoke about the, the masculinity triad and, and hearing pieces of that come out in your conversation now and and really feeling that responsibility that, that um, I don't want to use the wrong word here and you can tell me if there's a better word, but feeling that burden um, yeah. uh, to provide for your community, uh, to provide for the people that you serve as a role model and just um, speaking about what you think of as part of that masculinity triad uh, that that sort of held you captive in that space and, and, and kept you from reaching out. Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly it. And I'm sure that um, Jocelyn can attest to a little bit of this as well, but, you know, I always talk about when uh, during these talks that I give is that black children from a very young age are told that they don't just represent themselves. They represent an entire community of people that look like them, millions and millions of faces and people that they will never see and probably never meet. But every time you step out of your house, every time you step out of the safety of your family, you're not just representing Jake Lawler. You're not just representing Jocelyn Willoughby. You're representing black culture. You're, you're representing an entire race because everything that you do will reverberate as an action about people that aren't black and how they view other black people. And I think that like that pressure for a 12 year old child, because I had that talk when Trayvon Martin was murdered, um, to have that, it's a, it's a crippling thing. And then to have that juxtaposed with everything that I was dealing with um, on top of the fact that my, my father was white and when I first joined the football team, my seventh grade year, uh, the, my black kids or my black teammates uh, would not accept me into the black community because my father was white um, because they had the same talk with their parents. And, you know, if I had went to one of my teammates birthday party and them not knowing my father, if he would have called 911, that would have meant the, the end of a life for somebody in their family. And so that I was too much of a risk. And then to be able to not figure out where I fit in, uh, it, it was a it was a traumatic experience. And I think it's what metastasized into what we're talking about today. So thank you. So again, that kind of additional burden of being being a part of something much larger than just you than just football really being identifiable 
you know, as a black man, as a member of the black community, as being an additional part of that burden. And, and uh, Joss, I don't know if it makes sense maybe to kick it over to you now and, and hear your thoughts and reactions. Yeah, sure. Um, I definitely, uh, the sentiments resonated of, of representing something bigger than yourself. Um, I think those talks are well familiar uh, with me and my family. I think several other black children, um, young adults who are raised in this society. Um, so that, that struck a chord with me for sure. But I think in terms of what brought me to this conversation, um, as I mentioned, I was a women's basketball player at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm currently a professional women's basketball player with the New York Liberty. And I think in both instances, I've been fortunate, I realized in hindsight, to be in cultures and around people who understand the importance of good mental health, especially when it comes to being the best person that you can be, the best athlete and performer that you can be. Um, and of course, being a student athlete, being a Black woman, and just carrying all these different identities um, comes with different levels of stress. And, and I think the term that we're using now is burdens. Um, and I think to be able to navigate, um, carry those different identities, navigate through them, um, and again, be the best person, the best, the best athlete that you can be, you have to be in a good mental space. Um, and so knowing the importance of that in some of the struggles of my career, but also the success, I think it's so important to have these conversations um, and hopefully communicate the importance to others and, and help people see the struggles, but then also areas for improvement and, um, you know, hopefully the success that we can have if we continue these conversations. Thanks, Joss. And, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of, uh, and building on that word burden, it may be a desired burden. It may be something that you choose and you want. It doesn't make it any less heavy sometimes. And so just sort of recognizing that with platform and with some elements of privilege, there also come some elements that are very hard to, to carry. And so being in that best mental space, um, the best mental space you can be becomes invaluable in terms of managing this. And so as you, as you all consider and bringing you in too, Rachel, as you all consider your experiences, what are some of the things looking back on your, your careers in, in college in particular that really were buffers or things that helped you get through managing the, the undesired and the desired elements of burden? Um, and then afterwards, we can talk a little bit about what are some of the things that were more challenging in that regard. Um, I can chime in on that a little bit. Um, I generally like to think of myself as a very positive person. So kind of going through the daily um, routine, I guess I'd say as a student athlete, you know, we're basically in a really like strict schedule of, you know, wake up, work out, then you have you eat something, then you go to class, then you go to another practice, and it's just kind of a recurring cycle and a, a very um, routine that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So you kind of just get in that. But something that helped me personally, besides um, my uh, attitude, I guess, towards life in general, um, would be my teammates, just kind of knowing that they were also going through the similar things and the, the bonds that you made with your teammates, and I still have them to this day and I'm sure Jocelyn and Jake still have great teammates that they're good friends with and help them get through this but um, they were definitely a source that I used to help with the stress and the burdens of being a student athlete. Um, when I transferred to the University of Florida just being at an SEC school the resources that you have there the the like mental health resources, the nutritional resources, the academic resources, um, just not being afraid to use all of those that are at your disposal. I mean, I think the one thing that I personally struggle with, and I'm sure a lot of other people do is asking for help. That first step of asking for help, I think is the most important because then you realize that, oh my, I'm not the only person who needs this or needs that. So just realizing that all that you have are the resources at your disposal are for you and are meant to help you be the best that you can be as an NCAA student athlete. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And I guess one one follow up to that is, is thinking back to using those resources what what do you think was sort of the deciding factor was it the realization that you're not alone 
and that others do this? Or was there, was there some other um, instance or protective factor that entered into the picture for you that allowed you to take that initial step? Um, so as far as that, I would say, I don't know if it was, I think I more realized I wasn't alone when I, like after I took that step, but I would have to say it would be my teammates realizing that, oh, you have a little bit of drop in energy. Maybe you should go talk to this person or maybe you should like look at yourself and maybe have a conversation. It's like, they, I knew that they were telling me because they were concerned, not that they were like mad or upset or anything. So I think just like having those teammates and building those relationships as a student athlete and being able to trust them and your coaches, just that helped me realize that I needed to utilize those resources. So the power of your peers in particular, hearing it, hearing it from a peer went a long way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Joss, Jake, other, other thoughts about um, protective factors or, or, assistive factors in, in the mental health awareness and process for the two of you? Yeah, I'd say, I think, um, building off of what Rachel said, I think teammates are definitely helpful, but I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to have those conversations with those teammates. I'm thinking back, especially to my younger self when I was coming in as a first year or what other universities would call a freshman, um, and just realizing, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, you don't know all that your your experience is going to entail, and you don't know the resources that you'll need down the road. But I think one of the things that was most helpful and that I, you know, as I got older and was an upperclassman, um, a role that I took on was helping up front the first years or younger new players know, you know, you can, it's okay to go to certain resources. Um, these services are available, but having that information up front, you may not need it then, but at least knowing that things are available. And as you know, we all as a team went through our journey when things got tough, saying like, you know, I may notice a, te a change in my teammate and saying, okay, you know, remember this resource that we talked about way back then, it's still available. Or even if I need it, like, hey, I'm using this resource. Um, but just having the information up front and then constantly relaying it over the course of time um, is, I think, incredibly helpful because sometimes it can be very hard. I think one of the hardest things is to be vulnerable and to ask when you're in the heart of an issue for help. Um, and so I think giving information and resources before somebody needs help is always um, a good way to kind of prime people so that they're easier and more readily acceptable of whatever they need. Yeah, and I think going off of both of those statements, what happened for me um, specifically is that like, I, I UNC has always done an incredible job in terms of making resources available, especially with uh, Coach Mac Brown and his staff. Um, they've gone out of their way to make sure that players are taken care of in every capacity but when you're in that space especially how I was what what motivated me to keep it hidden and keep it secret and like I said like I continue to do all these different things um, and then being being a collegiate athlete amplified all of those pressures because now it, like the deadlines weren't just high school deadlines I mean they, they were it, they were the difference between right and wrong they were difference between having a scholarship and not having a scholarship. Um, if a regular college kid would get in trouble on a night out, nothing would happen. If I did, it'd be on ESPN. And I, I kept everything hidden solely really be, to save my parents um, because I knew that they were, they were amazing parents. They're the best parents that I could have ever received. And I thought that telling them what I had went through, especially about the suicide attempts, it would break them. And I did not, the whole thing about my depression is that it was personal for me. Um, this was my problem. This was my, I had to find a solution. No one else could help me because if I told someone else that I would, I would unload that burden onto them and I should be the only one that bears it. And especially when it comes to people that I love, I, I thought that me telling them would break them and they would think of themselves as bad parents they would have think of themselves as failures and i would have been left ruminating in the ashes of a fire that i had created ultimately when i got to a point 
thankfully uh, my uh, roommate Michael uh, told me that and really helped me throughout those five months in terms of opening up and trying to figure out what exactly I've been going through and why I've been going through it. I began to realize something is that when you tell other people when you tell other people that you're dealing with depression, you're not unloading a burden, you're sharing it with them because more often than not, they've been going through similar things. At least in my experience, I've had an overwhelming amount of, you know, empathy and, you know, regards and kind, kind words, but more so than that, I've had other people tell me about their trauma as well. I remember when I told my team for the first time, I told them all in person and, them being predominantly black and growing up in similar communities, how I grew up, I wasn't necessarily sure how they would react and they were all incredibly effusive and gracious with their support. But what was most surprising is that in the coming weeks, they would come up to me and tell me that they've been dealing with something, uh, dealing with similar things that I've been dealing with. And unfortunately for better or for worse, I think that trauma is the greatest community builder when it comes to human community and when you go through something, there's a shared psyche that happens there. And it, I learned that when I told my parents that they didn't think that they were failures, that it was a chemical imbalance and chemical imbalance. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Like if you get a broken arm, you don't just power through it. You know, you go see a doctor. If you're sick, then you take medicine. It's, it's the same thing goes with depression. You have to seek out help because it is something that needs amending and it needs ameliorating. And that's really what I learned is that the moment that you do speak out on it, it's not something that your voice won't be snuffed by fear of retribution or anything like that. It'll, in fact, at least in my experience, it was amplified. And one of the most poignant responses I got was a father um, whose son had committed suicide. He DM'd me on Twitter and shared with me the eulogy that he gave at his son's funeral. I had never met this man in my life. I, I probably never will. But we had that moment of connection and that that rang true for so many people that reached out to me and I, in turn i reached back out so yeah the power of sharing and i think you know speaking to that word vulnerability that um that i think all three of you are talking about is um that there's strength and, and healing and amelioration that comes from shared vulnerability and uh, the, the power of putting words to things. And I know uh, we, we had the opportunity to kind of catch up on that before, but to actually name something, um, even naming the word suicide, to be able to say that out loud as opposed to um, tiptoeing around it or hinting at it, but to really be able to say that out loud uh, and, and take some of the power away from something like that and being vulnerable enough about our own experience to, to acknowledge it and, and um, recognize the shared human experience that we all have and, and uh, to, to give a shout out to Clemson I know there are student athletes there that um, that talk about sharing their scars um, and that those scars are something that um, rather than trying to hide them they're able to own them and by owning them the adversity that they go through allows them to be stronger on the other side and, uh, and that's what I'm, I'm hearing about here in, in all your discussions um, it, it might be uh, I'm noticing there's a question in the uh, in, in the box that maybe to pose to the panel. Um, I'll read it out loud in case you can't see it from Kiambra Griffin. How might you suggest coaches and other personnel guide student athletes through the process of finding professional help? So, if if you're if you're a student athlete, how might you do that? But really, um, from this standpoint, how do coaches and others? As a student athlete, how would you want coaches and other personnel to help guide you through that process? And I can offer some thoughts, but let's start with you as the experts. I just go back to uh, part of my comment before. And so I think um, it's important to, again, be proactive. You don't want to wait until you're in the middle of a crisis to be providing resources or suggesting resources. Um, so whether it's in your beginning of the year team meeting, letting it no be known and clear that these resources are here. Um, in my experience, I think one of the most uh, frustrating things is if a crisis has happened and you know you get the email from school or athletics administrators and it's at the end, it's a, a kind of comment. If you need help, you know, reach out to these services. And yes, that's important to include and necessary to include, but again, 
being proactive uh, with providing and making those resources uh, well aware. Um, I think the other thing that's so important as a student athlete, I've seen it for myself and also with teammates, is um, knowing that you have coaches who care, right? So I think one of the biggest things is not, as a student athlete, if you're having an issue, not having a coach kind of being the doctor that's just referring to you, where it's just like, okay, you know, I see you're struggling, make sure you go see this person. Um, I think it's important to know that they care, that you can have a conversation, you can be vulnerable with them as well. And even though they may not be the professional help that you may need um, or be able to solve everything or fix everything, it's important to know that that first person does care more about you than just saying, you know what, I can't handle this, there's this other person, you're a burden on my hand, go to this other person. Um, I think that's so important um, to the experience of the student athlete, but then also I think the relationships um, that student athletes have with coaches or other administrators, I've seen it kind of be fractured in some ways just because it seems like the coach doesn't care about the student athlete. They're mandating, which I personally don't agree with, but mandating that this player or student athlete go see um, professional help. Um, so those would be my recommendations of just how to approach the process. I don't know if Rachel or Jake, you have other um, thoughts on it. Um, yeah, so kind of bouncing off what Jocelyn said, um, I definitely think the coach athlete relationship needs to be built kind of proactively, like from freshman year. I mean, even as you're being recruited in the process of just showing them, I saw what you did last weekend. I'm like excited to have you on my team, just like starting to foster that relationship. And then once they get there, just like showing them this is where they like belong and what they're a part of. And so even doing one on one meetings, but I feel like it's also important to do team activities so even I know at Florida we had a bunch of um, I'm not sure if they were like uh, psychologists to say but we did a lot of team building activities where we talked about hard stuff where we talked about things that needed to be talked about and just like developing those conversations in a safe space and having those conversations with a group of people just made it more aware and people were more likely to seek that individual help if they needed it more so than just our group meeting session. So just having a safe space or even if it's not even among your team, if it's just like a group of people on your team that you feel like you can have these conversations with or as a coach, like saying, oh, maybe go talk to so-and-so about this. Um, just having those like go-to leaders, I would say, um, that aren't afraid to, um, you know, talk to those, have those conversations with people too. Yeah, I mean, I think that both of those points raised are um, extremely valid and they resonate with me. I mean, good leaders lead and bad leaders don't. Um, and one of the one of the most inspiring things, and I think what really got the ball rolling in terms of my growth and development was when Coach Brown came. And within like the first 15 minutes of our initial meeting, he told us that like if if you are struggling with mental health issues, or if you've thought about suicide, if you thought about any of these things, um, don't hesitate to come to one of these coaches' offices. Don't hesitate to come to my office. Um, we wanna make sure that you guys are being looked after in every single capacity um, because we care more about, we care more about your experience as an individual rather than your experience as a player. And those words weren't just empty, they were backed um, by actions every single day. And I think that the most important thing is having people come to grips with what they've been dealing with of their own volition. Um, I think forcing someone or mandating someone to attend something never really works out uh, the way that we would like it to. Um, but to be able to be that, be that uh, bridge to build that gap and understand, understand that you have to come to this of your own you have to come to this in your own and once you do you will be supported in every possible capacity through the resources that we have is much more impactful than just like jocelyn said having an empty list of things to go to and then you being completely overwhelmed if there's no roadmap to success then you you're going to get lost in the you're going to get lost in the shuffle and i think having vocal coaches um 
even vocal administrators uh, taking this as an important objective moving forward in terms of developing student athletes is something that really I think helped me a great deal. And I know it's helped a great deal of my teammates. So. Thank you all. Lots of um, really phenomenal insights shared there. And just picking up on something that Rachel said and, and uh, Jocelyn, you and Jake also picked up on, this really is developmental. Um, well, wellness as a culture is developmental and it starts on day one. It starts in minute, in the first 15 minutes in, in, uh, in your situation that you're bringing up, Jake. Uh, and, and it doesn't finish there. It's sort of an ongoing conversation and it is proactive in that sense. And it is also recognizing power. And, uh, and I think that's a really uh, critical piece of this is that when, when we hold positions of power, we want to recognize that power differential sometimes makes it so hard to be honest about and vulnerable about what we're going through. And that becomes a barrier to recognizing the invisible hurt. It's one thing if you're talking about a, a, an ACL tear or a torn labrum or rotator cuff, it's an entirely different thing to be talking about something that is invisible. Um, or isn't evident all the time. And so to, to use, um, to recognize when you're in a position of power and to be able to use that power to create that plan. And some of the most powerful situations that I've seen are when a head coach actually says, I wanna go with you. I wanna go to the first appointment with you. And I don't need to sit in on it, but I want you to know how much I value this and that I'm going to go with you to that first appointment just to say, this is important to me to recognize this as your head coach. And, um, and I want you to know that I value the effort that you want to put into this, whatever it is. And I don't want to be behind the closed door when the confidential space starts, but I really want to be, be that bridge. I'm sorry for forgetting who actually used that term, but I love that term. So, so not just saying, here's a list, um, check a box and go do it, but to actually say, if you're willing, I'd like to walk with you and, and go with you to, to introduce myself to the resource and, and just say that I'm, I value this and I'm part of this the care process if you want me to be. Um, and again, I know there might be some pushback on that idea, but I'm interested to hear the panel's thoughts uh, about that notion of, of using power that directly to level the playing field. Yeah, I think uh, from my experience, I remember when I told after I had written it, I wasn't necessarily sure about what I was going to do with it, but then I had come to the realization that it could do some good. So before then, I didn't want to drop a bomb and have people scrambling to figure out what exactly happened. I did the legwork and I told uh, my coaches that this is what I've been dealing with, culminating with a meeting with Coach Brown. And we talked for like an hour about what I had been struggling with and uh, what I'd been dealing with. And of course, he's incredibly busy doing everything he has to. Uh, but to be able to like take an hour out of his day and spend time with me and talk about some of the things that he's dealt with former players that have been dealing with mental health issues and how he's still in contact with them and looking me in the eyes and telling me that like whatever help that I need, I was going to get and he was going to make sure it's going to be the best uh, really made all the difference. And him and I are still in contact to this day and we still check up on each other. And I think that without, without that conversation, without that initial um, statement in the first 15 minutes of, uh, of our first meeting, without him being a vocal and active voice, both in the mental health space and in the development space, which are, you know, of course, inexorably linked to each other, um, without him doing that and without making sure that his coaching staff would do the same thing, uh, I honestly don't know if I would be here today. So I think that that really did make all the difference for me. Um, just to bounce off of that, I was going to say as important as it is for like that initial step, I think the follow up is even more important. Just showing that, you know, you're continuing to be aware of what is going on with your student athletes and what they need and making them help because they're not going to perform the best in life as well as their sport if you're not, you know, not on top of them, like what's going on, but like, as like caring. I mean, like I would consider 
like my coaches, like family, just because, you know, that I built that relationship. It was leg work for them and it was leg work for me. I mean, we went through so much just, I mean, as Jake kind of said, the traumatic experience definitely bonds people. Um, I was fortunate enough not to have a, as much as a traumatic experience, but still, I mean, as a student athlete, you go through the stresses of the daily life and just building those relationships with your coaches. Um, and knowing that now even my old coaches, both of them still, you know, contact me and want to talk to me and just have conversations just as friends. But following up, I would say, in my opinion, is just as important as initiating that first um, step of help with your student athlete. And ultimately, I think, um, Jason, when you began this, you were saying, you know, it's on an individual by individual basis. So I think it's so important to know your student athlete, who you're catering to, because um, I can speak for myself. You know, if my coach is like, hey, I'm going to walk you to your first meeting, I would kind of be like, uh, no, thank you. Um, not doing that. But, uh, you know, it goes to knowing your student athlete. Um, but then also, I think it's important as any person, but as a leader, especially to be authentic to who you are. If that's not necessarily within your nature, student athletes aren't gonna feel comfortable with that. Um, so just finding out what works for the student athlete, what works for you, what's comfortable um, in that first step, but then also as Rachel was saying, and following up as well. And one other thought, if I may add, um, I think the other thing that's been really big for me uh, is having resources present and available in the day to day so that it's not like oh i don't even know who this person is i don't know what they look like and you know i have to step out on faith and, and reach out but you know whether it's through team building i think it's rachel and maybe jake were both talking about um having staff having um professional resources <laughs> just people who would be able to um or willing to have tough conversations present in the day-to-day -day basis so you have a better idea of who to turn to, what those people look like, who they are, um, and can feel comfortable. Hey Jason, now you're, you're muted. Thanks, Jake. It's only the third time today I've done that. Um, so great integration, uh, all of you. I really appreciate that. And, and I think um, that point is well taken. It is about building building that relationship with your student athletes, so you know what they what they need and, and what they want. And um, what I'm also hearing that I think is important that you're saying too, Jake, is is the willingness to be vulnerable yourself. Again, that's part of what helps lower some of that power differential and increase that openness to to uh, being vulnerable. Um, and so I love hearing those pieces of it. Joss, I appreciate that feedback too. I think that's spot on. Um, you you got to know your athlete and that's where it starts for sure. Um, and I think you're all saying that and uh, there's no shortcuts to that. And I think that's a, a thing that we all have to remind ourselves. We all think that we have a history wherever we are and that history buys us a certain degree of connection. And, um, you know, just putting this out there for our student athlete, our, our graduated student athletes, you know, does that ever become a barrier that because somebody has longevity at an institution, that means, boy, I, I've got a shortcut into having a relationship. And is, is that ever potentially a barrier that student athletes face when it comes to acknowledging um, their struggles? Yeah, I think I can uh, talk a little bit about that. I know that um, yeah, I think when it comes to because we had a we had a coaching change and a coaching transition, but we still had um, we saw the same athletic director, and for the most part, we had we saw similar faces uh, during that transition. It was just the new immediate staff was brought in, um, but I do think that there's a sense of there's a sense of finality to it a little bit. I I think that uh, especially for athletes that are like coming up on graduation, similar to how I was. Um, I was sort of under the impression of like, what difference would it make if I if I spoke out now? Um, just because, you know, there, there were freshmen that were gonna be here much longer than I was. Uh, coaches hopefully would be there much longer than I was um, to be able to develop the incoming classes. 
that it, it seemed it seemed sort of strange that like this late in the twilight of my career that I would be opening up about this. But I think that there's there's a sense of power in that as well. Uh, there's a sense of balance that comes with that. I think that being at an institution for so long that you're, or for, in my case, for three years, um, you develop those relationships with other people. You develop those relationships with the people that um, aren't in your immediate circle. Uh, the UNCA student athlete community is is pretty massive and it's pretty interconnected. Um, so being able to formulate a dialogue, not necessarily regarding mental health initially, but just being able to reach out to other people that don't play your sport or, you know, develop relationships with people in the classroom, uh, teachers in the classroom as well, that you begin to cultivate a voice if you're willing to do that. And ultimately, um, I was doing multiple different things in multiple different spaces before uh, talking about mental health and to be the sort of like jack of all trades when it comes to stuff outside of football. I was able to sort of make that segue a little bit easier just because I I had built and cultivated that voice. And I think that, of course, you know, there's a few drawbacks, like I mentioned, but at the same time, I think it might even so be easier to speak because, you know, these people, um, whereas with incoming freshmen, it's much harder to be so open because of how stigmatized mental health is. Um, but I, I think that 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 balance is changing, I think, with people like Coach Brown and other people that um, are taking that power dynamic, as you said, and uh, making it a level playing field to more of it's, it's a more of a dynamic partnership rather than a, a hierarchy. Um, I think it, hopefully we will come to a point where even incoming freshmen, even recruits can uh, have these conversations in like the in-home visits with the coaches and be able to be open and understand their needs and struggles as well as options to move forward if they choose to do so. What a great point about even expanding it down to the relationships that you're building um, in the recruiting process, again, to sort of speak to the culture that, you're, that you have and that you continue to create. Um, that's a, a really good idea. And, um, I know that uh, we're sort of in the wind down phase of, of this uh, presentation, um, but also thinking a little bit about the idea of on the other side of the coin, we've got onboarding when we talk about recruits and, and freshmen, first year student athletes. How about the, um, the offboarding process and, and, and what can we do from a mental health perspective that helps student athletes prepare for what's next? So each one of you has kind of done that. Um, and you know what? What are your thoughts about how these pieces are are handled? What went well, and, and what suggestions might you have for how to continue to improve that offboarding process? Well, I think one thing is just um, kind of going back to the last question and tying it to this one as well. I think one of the um, big conceptions is that as you get further in your career, it's like by now you should have it all figured out. Um, you shouldn't be struggling anymore or uh, you should be able to get through that. And I think sometimes, you know, as an upperclassman, if you're struggling, like that's hard because people are looking at you to be that model, to be that, you know, perfect um, player, perfect person, so on and so forth. And it's harder to be vulnerable when you have those pressures. And I think um, especially as you're looking outward at, it's hard for me to answer that question because I think for me, my like final year was cut short. So I didn't even have the full time to go through that um, outboarding process. But I think in general, it depends on what the student athlete is turning towards next, um, what their next destination and journey is going to be. Um, for me, I'm fortunate enough to be able to continue playing basketball. So in some ways it was a, a easy um, transition because it's just getting your mind ready to know that you're gonna kind of go through the freshman ranks all over again. Um, but for some people, it's helped figuring out like, okay, who am I without my sport? You know, what do I do next? And so beginning to have those conversations, I think is helpful. Um, and I think one thing I've heard from just thinking about myself, but then also other teammates is um, not being dropped so quickly. I think sometimes when the season's over, it's like, do you still care about me? Like, am I still part of the team? You go from having this close knit community to really just being by yourself um and so just like help navigating through that i think is is 
helpful. Um, I liked what Jocelyn talked about there with the identity portion of it, because I feel like that as athletes and I mean, sports specific, um, just speaking in my um what I've gone through. Um, gymnastics, you start at such a young age. I started at the age of three. So I was a gymnast from three until I was 22. So just, I mean, one day you snap your fingers and you're not a gymnast anymore. So just being one thing I've done my entire life. And then the next day I'm, I don't like, what am I? So I still have to say I am currently struggling with that um, identity aspect of being an athlete, but being involved in gymnastics still as a coach um, has definitely helped me working through that process, um, like being able to help gymnasts um, who are going through the same struggles that I went through or who are facing like similar obstacles, just being that person, that go to person, like how, what did you do? or how did you do this, or what can I do differently, or me even thinking about it in a different space, just because I'm not in their shoes, I was in their shoes. Um, just, I mean, that aspect of it, I think is definitely important. And um, another offboarding thing that I've thought about as a mental health aspect is that schedule, I kind of touched on it earlier, just the strict schedule of waking up, working out, doing all that stuff, and then one day not having to do that stuff. Um, so I think it is important for NCAA um, uh, people who work with student athletes, just that they are aware of that that process and how you want to stay active and you want to eat well and just that you don't have those similar resources once you graduate and just ways to wean yourself off, I would say, of that lifestyle. I mean, you can still continue to do it if you have those resources at your disposal, but just the aspects of the student athlete life that kind of just go away that day that you're no longer in that space. And I think uh, my transition was a little bit easier, uh, just to reiterate, like I said prior, um, my experience with football, uh, I it was never what I was. Um, it was just something I fell into. And I was incredibly thankful for the journey that it gave me. I don't think I would be here without football. I don't think I would be where I'm at or have the drive or the passion or the connectedness to the people that I've met if I didn't have it. But at the same time, it was never my identity. Um, and I had actively tried prior to talking about mental health to be more than an athlete, to use the terminology. Um, but I, it, w it was difficult because it was something that I had done for such a long time. Uh, coming to grips with that was it was, it was a difficult thing to reconcile, but I think at the same time, I had made my peace with my journey. Um, I think a lot of people get caught up in like pursuing the dream with every iota um, of, of being that they have in their body. Um, and you either get hurt one of two ways, either physically or emotionally. And I was staring down the prospect of continuing to play for two more years and hoping something would work out or walking away from it and stepping away from it of my own volition. I think that that was something that made all the difference in terms of being able to come to that decision rather than it being stripped away from me. Um, but in terms of the offboarding process, like I said, you know, Coach Brown and I, we still talk um, very consistently. I still speak with uh, some other people on the coaching staff very consistently. I still speak with a lot of my teammates very consistently. And even being 2,500 miles away from them. We, like we, we still have a relationship. We still have a dialogue. Um, and I, I, I think it's about building those relationships and allowing them to live past just the uh, teammate bond and about more, it's a more about a friendship and it's about, it's dealing with things that revolve outside of football. And once you have your finger on that button, um, being able to press it whenever you like, I think makes, makes a good deal of difference. So. Yeah, thank you all. I think I uh, appreciate the richness of those um, those responses and uh, hearing a lot about personhood, um, not just playerhood, that, um, that I'm still valued as a person, even if my playing days are going to come to an end, and, and that um, that is something that's built into a good quality relationship, and that part of that transition and offboarding process is really about 
being able to continue to connect in a way that allows you to feel like you, you still belong to that community, to that culture. Um, but also hearing that uh, it does present an identity challenge um, that um, as a, an athlete that has exhausted their eligibility or their time, that it's now sort of a search process. Okay, what do I fill the void with? What do I now uh, put into place here? And so uh, I, I, uh, I think it's very helpful to hear that um, just because you finished your time in the actual playing of your sport, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the burden or the challenges are finished. Um, sometimes they're only just beginning or they're transforming. Um, and so sort of recognizing the, the importance of, of continuing that support. Um, I'm recognizing again uh, time. I don't know if there are questions from the audience that they'd like us to take a shot at um, in the last few minutes here. Um, certainly type them into the question section, um, but also really do uh, want to take the time to appreciate the panel. I'm very, very grateful for your insights, your expertise. I mean, you really are experts at, at how, uh, how we can do better, um, how to make the invisible more visible. And, and I think it is about making it visible in your culture, in your programs, in your departments, in your universities. It, it isn't always about making it visible in the individual, but making it visible in our culture, in our community, and, um, and, and allowing us to accept the platform that athletics gives us to do just that. And, and I'm really grateful for our, our public figures, uh, Shaniqua Holsclaw, uh, Dak uh, Preston, Preston, Prescott, sorry, uh, most recently, Michael Phelps, uh, Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, so many others that have been willing to speak uh, about their personal experience and, and the power behind using their voice as strong athletes, as strong people uh, to really make, the, make this visible. Any closing thoughts from our panel? I just want to say uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, it was great to speak with my fellow panelists and you as well, Jason, and I think that continuing to have conversations like this is what's going to make the difference because um, once you, I think you say it, like you said, you take the power away a little bit and it's, it's not about being frightened by it. It's about understanding that depression is real and that a lot of people deal with it and that all aspects of mental health need to be enriched and enhanced in our community. So. Thanks. Jim. Um, Oh, I also just wanted to say thanks so much, everyone, for having all of us and Jason for your amazing insights and Jake and Jocelyn for sharing your guys' stories. Um, I hope one of us connected with someone in the audience and um, that any of us, I'm sure, I hope I can speak on your guys' behalf, would be willing to um, discuss any of the things that we talked about today in the session and um, that everyone has an amazing rest of your day. <laughs> well put, Rachel. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just echo a lot of what's already been said and um, just thankful for this space um, to be able to share and also learn. Um, I think you all have great insight. Um, that I'm grateful for it and thankful to be able to, you know, spread it and continue this conversation. Um, I think if I were to just leave one thing or reiterate one thing, it would just be the importance of being proactive and um, as we kind of use the analogy of physical versus, you know, the invisible mental um, struggles or illnesses, um, just as you have a checkup to make sure, you know, nothing flares up physically, I think it's important to have that mentally. And that can either be in the form of a friend, a teammate, a coach, um, or even a professional resource. And so um, just leaving the importance of being proactive. And again, thank you all. Thanks again for everybody joining us and uh, we look forward to more presentations uh, through Influencer.